Welcome to Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. Tonight, how the Bob Woodward book and the Congressman Foley page scandal are contributing to the online battle for control of Congress. They're sick people. They need mental health counseling. They certainly don't need to be interacting with children. But first, one of America's greatest playwrights now has a movie about him. Tony Kushner, the Pulitzer and Emmy Award winning author of Angels in America, Caroline or Change, and other important plays, is the subject of a documentary film called Wrestling with Angels, playwright Tony Kushner. It's showing at the Film Forum in Lower Manhattan through October 17th, at least. We will meet the filmmaker in just a minute. First, here is a clip from early in the film in which the viewer meets Tony Kushner giving a commencement address. What to say to the graduating class of 2002, to you vibrant young people leaving college and entering the great world beyond, just in time to be trampled flat by the four horsemen of the apocalypse? <laughs> Duck might be a good place to start. Stockpile canned goods and huge vats of water. This is a time of crisis, and in a time of crisis, we all have to focus on getting real. And you, what do you do? You get a playwright to deliver the 2002 commencement speech. Thank you for inviting me, but I worry about you. <laughs> Why couldn't you have gone for something a bit more techno-savvy? Someone from the movies, Spider-Man, for instance. Why someone from the theater, for God's sakes? Do you want everyone to think you're gay? <laughs> what am I doing here, is I guess my question. And one of the answers ought to be, I am here to be political. I am here to be a citizen in a pluralist democracy. Why you? Because the world will end if you don't act. Will the world end if you act? Who can say? Will you lose your soul, your democratic citizen soul, if you don't act? I guarantee it. So commence already a million billion mazels to you and your parents and your teachers and to Vassar. I am certain you are aflame. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Now, now, now. The world is waiting for you. The world needs you desperately. Organize. Speak the truth. Thanks. Tony Kushner, wasn't that great? I guess actors have to memorize their lines, but playwrights can read them. With me now, Frida Lee Mock, the producer and director of Wrestling with Angels, playwright Tony Kushner. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Why a movie about Tony Kushner? Because I feel he has a great deal to uh, say and to show us about both playwriting as well as about life, because his work is both a uh, work as an artist and both uh, as an activist. At least that's how I perceived him when I first saw him. That uh, clip of yeah. the uh, commencement address, he's so electric and he was so real. He was kind of so down to earth in telling them, yeah, yeah, million billion mazels, congratulations, but now let's get down to work, organize, act. Absolutely. Well, I think that's uh, how I first saw him, not through his w plays, but actually it was also a commencement address in which he somewhat inspires people by saying, look at the world in which you can do a great deal to make it a better place. And, uh, you know, his, his talks are very, as you can see, very illuminating, very, very funny, and very serious. And uh, that combination for me as a filmmaker spoke to, said, uh, I think there must be uh, some, something to possibly to make a film that has a great deal of substance and also a great deal of entertainment. Now that's an interesting thing that you said. Your first exposure to Tony Kushner was not through one of his plays but at a commencement address? Yes. Actually. Where, where and when? It's actually it was in Wesleyan where actually my daughter was graduating. Uh -huh. I think it was 2000. Yeah. And uh, he was, uh, he was given an honorary doctorate uh, and he was told he could speak but he could speak for only one minute. Uh -huh. So it was a brilliant, it was a, a tour de force. The one minute stuck with us. I think we were just laughing and thinking as well, because he was talking about giving all of us, particularly the graduates, a catalog of evils that you should, you should think about ridding. Evils. Evils. And it was a litany that I think all of us on either side of the political divide could agree upon, such as bad education, illiteracy, the plight of refugees, um, racism, sexism, sort of the th usual things, but it was all just uh, read and spoken because you can see he's very rapid when he's in public, yes. um, that had us kind of catching up our breath and thinking, you're thinking and also thinking and also feeling 
um, you're, he's right, you know, that well, there is something else we can do. And it's funny because in a way he's preachy, but he's so down to earth that he doesn't come off like, you know, your uncle uh, lecturing you. Exactly. Well, I think because actually, I think he feels it. He, he genuinely, it's, 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 it's in his bones, so to speak. Yeah, so um, it's from the heart as well as from the head. All right. Here's another clip from the film, Wrestling with Angels, playwright Tony Kushner. This is part of a work in progress called Only We Who Guard the Mystery Shall Be Unhappy. That's the title of the play. And this is a fictional scene that depicts First Lady Laura Bush reading to a very special group of Iraqi children. Dear children, please rise and give a warm welcome to our distinguished visitor, the First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Laura Welch Bush. Well, thank you, children. I don't believe I've ever had a more beautiful welcome. I love reading to kids. I, I meet so many kids. But most of the kids are wearing... They aren't usually wearing pajamas? No, <laughs> they aren't. Perhaps this is the first time you have read to dead children, Mrs. Bush. Oh, well, perhaps it is. <laughs> And I have to admit, children, I'm nervous. So you are the first Iraqi children I've met, and you look real sweet in your PJs, and I'm sorry you're dead, but <laughs> all children love books. Marsha Gay Harden as Laura Bush. Wow. Yes. <laughs> um, you notice that actually Tony, uh, it's sort of interesting because part of the film is about how does one become an artist, how does one create? And I thought, for me, um, the moment in which he came up with the idea of a Laura Bush work in progress was sort of dramatic in that he was in a demonstration against the war a month before the war started. And he was fairly depressed by that experience, and he went home and wrote what essentially what you see in this clip. He was depressed by the experience of the demonstrations or the fact that the war began anyway? By the fact that the war might have began, I think. Not, not, the, it, was, it was the feeling of what the impending, the pending war. I think. Um, and he said he just went home and, and wrote uh, all night and out of that came this. Wow. Piece. A little bit of, of magical realism there. That is, children playing dead children but in a realistic setting. And of course, he's got angels crashing through the walls in Angels in America. And so I guess he can do magical realism on stage. I, yes, I think the, 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 the form lends itself to uh, a range of daring provocations, I guess you might say. Do you think yeah. it's easier to depict the supernatural in theater or in film? No, it's easier, it's different. Um, I think, um, from what I can see in film, you, you have so many tools to go off and take you off on an imaginary journey. But um, from what I, uh, plays, because you're right there in a, a living situation, a real situation, um, depends on the electricity, I think, of the moment that it, it can lend itself. Do you think it detracts at all from Tony's work that he's so overtly anti-Bush? Do you think he'd be better off getting his message out in subtler ways through storytelling rather than something as hits you over the head as that? Well, I think it's rather empathetic, the Laura Bush story, in that um, um, I think, you know, he identifies with certain aspects of a person who, who loves literature and, and maybe with an individual who, who may not be as sympathetic to literature. Um, let me think. Uh, um, I think he has a capacity actually to bring people from the d other side of the divide. I think, in fact, this morning when you talked with him about um, that that prayer and uh, on AIDS, in which he talks about stunning, uh, stunning the other side with understanding. I mean, I think yes. he has a capacity. He does in his work. The same thing in Angels in America, where one felt really empathetic toward Rob, Rob, Rob Cohen, who is. For right. some people, it's because of the, 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 the embodiment of, of evil. evil. Yeah, we're, we're going to yeah. play that clip later on. Uh, Meryl Streep uh, reading the prayer on AIDS at the Cathedral yes. of St. John yeah. the Divine here in Manhattan. But Tony is very interested, and it comes through very clearly in your film, in otherness, in exploring the other, however you define that. So, for example, and a lot of people don't know this, he had a play ready to debut about the Taliban just before 9-11. 
And you remind us of this in the film. Yes, it was the film, uh, the play Homebody Cobble, which came out, well, it was in rehearsal right during, right before 9-11 happened. And so, you know, it startled people that there was actually a play that said Cobble. You know, the title is Homebody slash Cobble. Um, but to become, you know, to, to mount a play, it usually takes three to four years to yes. marinate and to research and to write. Right, so, and of course, Kabul, yeah. K-A-B-U-L, is the capital of Afghanistan. Absolutely. But who knew that in the United States until September the 12th, 2001? Absolutely, and after that, that this play, which may have been, you know, quietly mounted, became uh, the focus of a yeah. great deal, a great deal of attention. And, and the quote uh, f that he gives you in the film, that he's interested uh, in the Taliban and was at that time because he wanted to, I don't remember the exact words, but something like immerse himself in something as, as completely other to himself as possible. Yes, I think when he explains that so much of his, I guess, notoriety up to that point was Angels of America, which was about a, a very, on one level, a very American story, uh, although they were very universal issues and characters. And for various reasons, he decided he was interested in Afghanistan, just as I think as a student and uh, um, and just fascinated him about Soviet Union, and so for various reasons, it was, it was you know, he, he says he decided to do something other than American. But your, your question about why is otherness an, uh, a, an interesting aspect of his interest, and I think perhaps he himself was, has been an other because of a, being gay and uh, having been exposed to a people who have also been marginalized, and there's a sensitivity, I think, comes from being outside. Yes, yeah. and, he, and he talks about the various ways he's been outside from when he was a very young child. I think he says to you, um, I, I knew I was a sissy from the time I was six. Yes, and he didn't really fit in uh, the culture in which he should have been. And that was in the South, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Exactly, and uh, this is growing up in the 60s, even though there was hope, I think you could see that the Civil Rights Movement, I think, actually probably gave him uh, examples of what you could do if one were collectively involved and, and really reaching out and doing something about so, social injustice. Um, and I think maybe that kind of fed into how you see him today. So he was active. a little boy who wasn't into typical little boy things. He was a lefty, as he tells. He was the only lefty in his high school class. Exactly. And he doesn't say this, but I wonder um, if he was in a very small minority of Jews in his school in Lake Charles, Louisiana. He doesn't say that, but I, you know, the fact is there were about a hundred families that belong, Jewish families that belong to the temple, which is in the film. And so they do represent, you know, I don't know the percentage, but yeah. uh, in the South there's always been a group of uh, Jewish... An enclave you know, here enclaves, and there. Exactly. I mean, they, they, they were very strongly rooted, I think, and gave, I think, a great deal of foundation to Tony, if you think of it, he was a fourth generation his great-grandfather settled in, in Lake Charles. So you go back and, uh, I mean, that, those roots are, are on one level really wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And, and in a way, it's, it's, what he does is so challenging in this respect because he does try to have empathy with others, not just with whom he would be naturally sympathetic, right? Other minority groups who were discriminated against, you know, he could look at the Native Americans, he could look at whoever. That would be easy otherness. He goes to the Taliban. He goes to the conservative right, which is, you know, the arch enemy of him politically. Well, I think he's actually, as an artist, trying to understand because he's really developing characters. I mean, you say he goes to the Taliban. I think you have to be careful. But if you, you for know, material. For, for material. For a search for empathy. Yeah. For understanding. Understanding. And understand, with, understand comes empathy and uh, comes... Uh, um, comes truth and maybe solutions, you know, if one, I think he talked, talked to you this morning about how if one is, I think if one is open-minded, open-hearted, you can really go the distance and perhaps yeah. find yourself in a, uh, an awakening uh, yeah. that he feels the others can, that is the so-called enemy or the others on the political divide can also um, come around right. to find the when you say we spoke this morning, uh, some of the yes. viewers may not know, uh, Tony Kushner and I did a radio interview this morning on my radio show on WNYC. And one of the things that he said on the radio that surprised me is that he has not seen this film that you have made of him because he hates to see himself on film. Uh, true. <laughs> so I, although I, <laughs> did I you didn't, know that? I knew that he hasn't, I know that he hasn't seen the film. Uh, all the reasons uh, being perhaps also that, a lot of different reasons. I don't blame him, actually. I'd be mortified, actually, <laughs> even on this. Um, 
So um, that was not a condition of making the film, uh, and uh, maybe someday he'll. All his friends and his eight, six year old niece saw it and said she loved it. It seemed like 10 minutes. And, um, well, I think he's very so, photogenic. I do too. I you must, or you wouldn't have made a film that focused on him. You don't have to be necessarily photogenic. The elephant, well, not to say he's the an elephant, elephant man, man but he's a beautiful <laughs> human being, you know. And I think what attracted me to Tony was really his, his, his being and his, you know, artistic and social and political sensibilities. Yeah. You know, so it's mainly about character and spirit. Well, yeah. let's look another, at another clip from the film Wrestling with Angels, playwright Tony Kushner. This is from his play Caroline or Change about the relationship between a black maid and the Jewish family she works for in the South during the Civil Rights era. It's the defining incident that sets up the play. There's a bomb. President Johnson has built a bomb special made to kill all Negroes. I hate you. I hate you. Kill all Negroes. Really? For true? I hope drops his bomb on you. No hell is like this basement. Only hotter than this. Hotter than August with the washer and the dryer and the boiler full blast. Hell's hotter than goose fat. Much hotter than that. Hell so hot it makes flesh fry. And hell's where Jews go when they die. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that is such a compelling moment just in the history of American theater to start with. And such a compelling moment for the fact that they are both uttering racist statements, one after the other, which I think makes the audience rather than have a knee-jerk reaction against one or the other, have to look for complexity and have to look for root causes. Absolutely. It, it's, a, it's a stunning uh, confrontation. And uh, it says a lot about the larger picture of institutional racism and good people really caught in, in, a, in a, a situation, uh, however well-meaning. And this little boy, you know, was raised to be a good child, but when it comes to the real nuance of the relationship, the ugliness, the darker side does come out. Right. And, and she, too, uh, who's a good absolutely. person, has this dark moment in reaction. It's hot. She's in the basement. She's doing the laundry. The kid's getting on her nerves. And she's like, ah, Jews are going to hell. And, uh, you know, it's kind of out of character for her, too. And so here are these two relatively good people grappling with their dark moments. Yes. And I think Tony was pretty daring to really be so truthful about what he perceives as the, the difficulty of the relationships in black and white in the South and how, how perhaps that can be changed through addressing issues that oppress people, which is economics and race issues. And, uh, you know, it really gives you, us, the audience, really uh, the, you know, reason to ponder, you know, how did we get in the situation? Because these are wonderful people. The little kid is a, you know, a wonderful person. And um, there's a lot of levels of... Yeah. of uh, Stuff yeah, happens. Exactly. Stuff <laughs> happens. <laughs> yes. when, um, when I was watching the film, it, you know, something that I hadn't thought of before, Tony was grappling with the possibility that Carolina or Change could fail because it had gotten mixed reviews. He's not even sure at the point where you're filming him that it's going to make it to Broadway. Absolutely, yes. And here's somebody who had done Angels in America. Uh, maybe he at that point was getting complacent, although certainly not a complacent play, but getting, building an expectation that his stuff was going to succeed, and now, oh my God, people are judging me. Well, I think unless you believe strongly in what you're doing, you're not going to take all that effort and, and really, you know, go to, the, go to the, the distance. And, you know, truly he believed this was um, a popular, uh, one that was a more entertaining and uh, more mainstream. You know. um, he thought this would be. He, he despite thought, how difficult yeah. it is. 
Well, um, perhaps he didn't think it was that yeah. difficult. Or maybe the know? script isn't, but yeah. the idea is. Well, the musical, I mean, the musical form seems, you know, palatable to Broadway. Uh, it was shorter than most of his plays. It's only two hours instead of seven, you know, and all those elements. Huh. Uh, um, and it's an affectionate relationship with the boy, the family, yeah. and all those things. But I think it was really sobering for all of us knowing him and watching him that, that it takes such an effort, to, even as you say, this person who's highly respected and accomplished, to still have such struggles to go to Broadway. And um, I, I thought perhaps it had to do with Caroline. That maybe I said, maybe they're not ready to see a marginalized, a, a, a black maid be a major character who's serious yes. and to be treated seriously as opposed to, a, you know, romantic com comedy. Still more difficult in America than some people might like to believe. That's but the, right. the, the essence of his struggle there is fascinating to me because he wants, on the one hand, to be somebody who never compromises his values and makes his audiences think difficult thoughts and confront difficult realities. At the same time, he says to you, he wants to be a mass entertainer. He wants to have a mass audience. And those two things, of course, as we know, in any art, can bump up against each other. Yes, at the same time, actually, I think he's pointed out to me, too, how television, you think about it, is obviously the mass audience. And that there are very, very serious issues that are discussed, whether it's all in the family. And, you know, there are actually social <laughs> political issues that are, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, great cheat you know, ER or whatever, you know. In a popular form. Exactly. Law and order. Exactly. Um, so I think it's a great aspiration, you know. To, to, I think uh, people actually crave for things that are substance, you know, that are also entertain. Yeah. One more clip from Wrestling with Angels, playwright Tony Kushner. This is Kushner's prayer on AIDS that we discussed before as read by actress Meryl Streep in Manhattan at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. This is a prayer that Tony wrote 10 years ago. God, a cure would be nice. Rid those infected by this insatiable, unappeasable murderer of its lethal presence. Restore to health all those whose bodies beleaguered have betrayed them whose defenses have permitted entrance to illnesses formerly at home only in cattle and swine and in birds. Rid even the cattle and the birds of these terrors. Heal the whole world now, 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 now. Enlighten the unenlightened. Make them see with new eyes Christ's wounds as chaos lesions, his broken limbs, his pierced hands, stigmata of this unholy plague. Even John O'Connor, even Bob Dole, Giuliani and Gingrich, Jesse Helms and Pat Robertson, stun them with understanding to make them wiser, better, braver people. You can, you after all are God. Pay more attention. Amen. And there's that search for otherness again. He's dishing it to Gingrich and Giuliani and everybody else in that litany, but then he says, stun them with understanding. Don't damn them to hell. Absolutely. I think Tony has that real genuine um, belief that we can all work together if one... Um, we can, you know, if, if one can really allow oneself to truly understand what's going on. And, and uh, he's, he's, he's reaching out. I think it's, it's something we hope in all human endeavor, that there's uh, acceptance and redemption. And I think you see it around us. You, you've also done a documentary about the uh, architect, Maya Lin, yes. who did the Vietnam War Memorial, among other things. Absolutely. Yes, I have. Does something yeah. tie these two films together? Yes, in that people ask me, what's this film about when I was doing it in the last three, four years? And I said, it's very similar to the Maya Lin film. It's really a story about both an artist and uh, a person whose work has tremendous social and political resonance. And actually, I found the two of them quite a certain similarity, um, that um, they're sort of on the outside, and yet the impact is 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 a mainstream impact um, and, and we all seem to gain a certain a great deal of understanding and you know kind of measure of, of growth 
by, by their work. Tell the audience again when they can see it, where they can, they can see, see it. Today is the opening of uh, Wrestling with Angels, uh, playwright Tony Kushner. It's at the Film Forum exclusive engagement in, San, in New York. Um, and as long as people keep going in force the first week, the Forum will hold it for weeks and months. But it is rolling out to the rest of the country. So watch for it in all your art houses. And you and Tony have a Q&A with the audience coming up? Absolutely, on, on, on Friday after the 6 o'clock show. So I look forward to seeing all your viewers at, at uh, the Forum. Thank you very much. Good Thank luck. you very much. Coming up, how the Bob Woodward book and the Congressman Foley page scandal are contributing to the online battle for control of Congress. This is Brian Lehrer Live. Sure, my neighbors Gene and Louise, they may be superheroes with superpowers, but that doesn't make them so super at saving energy and money. I mean, I like them at all. But when Gene uses that power vision to cook dinner? Honey! Or, or, or when Louise or Starbright tries to save a little on the lighting bill? Mom, a little light? I may not be able to harness the power of the elements, but I save significant cash and help the environment with appliances, electronics, and windows featuring the Energy Star label. And I improved my home energy efficiency with insulation. My thermostat? Watch this. I'm just kidding. It's programmable. I don't have to lift a finger to save on AC and heating. Mom, Dad's making fun too again. So discover your own energy-saving superpowers. Go to ASE.org slash consumers. This is Scott McCloud, and you're watching Art or Something Like It. This is Brian Lehrer Live. We're here live Wednesday nights at 7.30. This fall, we're following the battle for control of Congress as it's being fought on the Internet. This week, as you might have been able to guess, clips from the Bob Woodward TV interviews are being forwarded around a lot, as well as video pertaining to the wholesome family values revelations about Congressman Foley of Florida. With us as our viewing partners tonight to check out the images and what they mean politically are two guests. Lisa Schifrin is probably most well known for writing Vice President Dan Quayle's Murphy Brown speech about unwed parenthood once upon a time. She has recently started a conservative issue advocacy group called Softer Voices. And Joe Connison, liberal columnist for Salon.com and the New York Observer and author of books including The Raw Deal, How the Bush Republicans Plan to Destroy Social Security and the Legacy of the New Deal. Our first clip tonight is of former Congressman Mark Foley of Florida on America's Most Wanted of All Things back in 2003. We track library books better than we track pedophiles and kids that are missing. We've got to force the states to incorporate technology, share information, because we can't take another loss of life of a child. Absolutely. Right. I believe that every convicted felon should be mandated nationwide to give his DNA. It solves crimes, it gets innocent people out of prison, and it will, it will eliminate the ability of these people to roam state to state in this country and rape people. From well, my view, when you rape a person, when you violate a child, you lose your civil liberties. So anybody that says we shouldn't take DNA samples, absolutely wrong. You commit the crime, you will supply the sample, and we'll be able to track and hopefully solve a lot of crimes. Well, good luck with your piece of legislation, because you're right, it, it will put some teeth into these registries. Well, if I were one of these sickos, I'd be nervous with America's Most Wanted on my trail. Well, I wish yeah, I could catch all of them. Think he's nervous now, Lisa Schifrin? Oh, he's past nervous. I think... Uh, when I saw that clip, I just couldn't even imagine what kind of psycho games this man played with himself for years and years and years. Uh, the whole story is unfortunate and horrible and offensive in every particular, but this just illustrates 
some kind of psychological disturbance that's that's beyond mere criminal. And Joe, he's got no friends. Democrats obviously right. have nothing to do with him. Republicans want nothing to do with him. Conservative groups and the Washington Times are coming out for the resignation of, uh, well, the Times at least, the conservative Washington Times, for the resignation of Speaker Dennis Hastert for what he knew about Foley but didn't right. go public with early enough. Uh, this is serious business, and it's not just well, playing no along political lines. Yeah, he has no, well, but Brian, he has no friends on the Republican side now because he was caught by ABC News. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were, they urged him to run again, according to Robert Novak today in the New York Post, has a column saying that uh, uh, Tom Reynolds, who is the chairman of the National Republican Congressional Committee, whose job is to re-elect the Republican majority. That's a congressman from New York, upstate New right, York, Tom urged, Reynolds, who's in a close race. Right, urged, uh, Foley to run again when? after last summer after they knew about his inappropriate uh, email contacts with this boy in Louisiana. And the reason was it would be easier to reelect the majority if he would run rather than having an open seat. This is why. So he has no friends now, but he had friends then, and he then gave $100,000, Foley did, to Reynolds' committee. Uh, which was accepted and, and which they're not giving back, by the way, or giving to charity like many politicians have done. How, now. How so it's, it's a big problem. For you the know what? I think we need to be fair. A. Reynolds at one time worked for Foley, so they had a long standing relationship. And I think that we are being very, very unfair to the Republican leadership. I think the Washington Times was unfair. I think that um, people did know about these emails. Reading the emails, they are very dubious. And if you were the parent of that child, you would be concerned. But they're not really serious evidence of, of any kind of sexual behavior. I, I think a funny thing, I think one reason that nobody pursued this the way it, it ought to have been pursued is that um, Congressman Foley was known to be gay and it was a kind of an open secret. I think you can easily imagine the uproar if people, if people pursued him for his uh, inappropriate uh, comments to, to pages. And, in, and there was no hard evidence, and nobody had seen the instant messages, and nobody really knew Lisa, the, the you know how long, of it. how long do you think it took ABC News to find those IMs once they started to look? It, not very long. If the House leadership had realized that this was a serious problem, if decided to do something about it. the House leadership had realized, I think that's But it was the obvious key. that it well, was. Well, what do we know about when they realized what? Well, today, Kirk Fordham, who worked for Tom Reynolds and Mark Foley at different times, most recently for... Reynolds, but then went back to advise Foley after he was caught by ABC News, was fired today. He says that he told them about this three years ago. He, when he was working for Mark Foley, he some said, of those IMs, said, the most explicit. No, he just he just IMs. said I'm worried about his inappropriate uh, approaches to uh, teenage pages. Okay, so they've known about this for years. They also, you're right, they knew that. Uh, Mark Foley was a closeted homosexual, but you know, gay bashing is not something they're afraid of doing. Whenever I, I they disagree. feel like doing no, it, every two I, years I they come up with the gay marriage amendment, and they're I think they're the gay marriage amendment is something around, that you can oppose on. You know, principle. gays and lesbians know, as much as they want. At, we got to go one at a time here, I'm guys. Sorry. I'm just going to let you finish your thought. No, I'm just saying I, they don't worry about being accused of gay bashing. They love to gay bash when it serves them politically. So the idea that they couldn't handle the Foley issue because they were afraid of being uh, accused of gay bashing is silly. Okay. They, they should have investigated it. Lisa. I disagree. I think that uh, that it costs Republicans enough to come out on principle against something like gay marriage. A third of all gays vote Republican on a regular basis. That Those people live in everybody's districts. Nobody wants to offend gays gratuitously. But that's a small minority of voters. It, it is a small a minority of voters. Like Chelsea. Nobody wants to... I think, I think political correctness in the better sense. I think people genuinely wish to be decent, and Republicans don't want to be tarred with gay bashing the same way they don't want to be racist. You know, Lisa, but Lisa, you, you know very well they know, could have investigated this, I think and they, they should have investigated, they and they didn't do anything because they didn't really want Joe, to know. You know what? I think it's like a lot of things. Until It's like Bill Clinton not really responding to Osama bin Laden. Until you have a missile let's hit you... Go, let's not go no, there. No, no. Until the missile hits you... Putting the dots together takes a funny kind of leap that people are always reluctant to make because it requires that they give up the comfort of 
how things are going. But just one piece of historical accuracy. Didn't the Republicans in the 2004 elections raise the profile of the gay marriage issue and their stance against it? Rather than fearing a backlash from seeing, being seen as anti-gay, they were trying to win the election on that basis. You know, that was the accusation. I think a bunch of judges in Massachusetts uh, passed a ruling okaying a gay marriage, forcing the hand of people who needed to cultivate their conservative base. I think... All right. One thing about this uh, this clip and and the fact that it's being passed around so much right. on the internet. I mean, it's bad enough in the era of old media to have America's Most Wanted <coughs> right. have that in their archives. Right. Um, how bad is it? Is it worse politically when you have the internet and people are emailing it and viewing it all over the place on YouTube? Well, I mean, Mark Foley's political career could not get any worse than it is now. I mean, you have to sort of wait for the punchline in that one, but. But that, um, I don't think that video by itself worsens things for the Republicans. I think it's kind of a, it's a, it's a black humor thing. You wait for the end and he says, you know, if I were one of these sickos. And it's kind of like any other joke, really, that you would mail around to your friends. Um, I don't know, the, the, what is um, troubling about it, I guess, for all politicians is that it has the look of Washington. You know, it has the end, so it kind of reflects on the hypocrisy of everybody in politics. Anything on the media context, the new media context of this? I, I think that it, it does make it incrementally worse. I think seeing that sort of thing adds a, a layer of kind of ridicule uh, to the the perception that people have of the congressman, and I, I think that it, you know, it just it pushes him further off stage. He's not coming back. In my whole life, I've never actually heard people um, defend alcoholics as as much as I did today by email because people sort of felt bad that he was uh, he was hiding behind the mantle of alcoholism to uh, to claim that that you know that was the uh, and the he's using his actions. it's interesting he's using alcoholism as an excuse he suddenly has recovered or revealed memories about being abused by a priest as a child right. he suddenly a la Jim McGreevy is coming out as a gay American as kind of cover for egregious behavior I don't think Gays want any part of this any more than Republicans do. Just take a phone call. Doug on Staten Hi. Island, you're on the air. Hi, Doug. Good evening. How are you? Good. How are you doing? First, let's just preface it with a little bit of science. If you guys have done your homework and looked at the study and the specifics were given by Randy Rhodes on Air America Today, you will find that 98.5% of uh, uh, pedophiles are heterosexual men. Uh, pedophilia, homosexuality is no more an indication of pedophilia than heterosexuality is of a uh, potential rapist. Right. I, I, you know, in, the, fair, in fairness, Doug, I don't think Lisa said anything about gays being more prone to pedophilia. She said the Republican leadership uh, may have been slow to accuse Mark Foley in public because they didn't want to be seen to, to gay bash. But would you also go where he's accusing you of going? No. No. In this case, you know, this is a man pursuing young boys. He is gay and he is a pedophile. This week we've seen pedophiles in other news stories in Philadelphia and, and Pennsylvania and elsewhere. Uh, that's not really a, a relevant issue here, I think. Elise in Manhattan Beach, you're on the air. Hello, Elise. Hi. Um, the reason why I called is because I think this, this whole thing is kind of funny. I used to read um, a magazine back in the late 90s and mid-90s called The Advocate, which is, which is a national gay magazine. And in that magazine, they talked about rumors about Mark Foley being gay back then. So I think all these politicians on both sides that are acting surprised about Mark Foley I think it's kind of a joke. But at least we have to separate being gay yeah, exactly. from engaging in, you know, predatory behavior. Right. Okay, so that was my other point. You didn't want people to out Mark Foley as gay if they knew just for being gay, did you? No, no, and that's my other point. I think I don't want anybody to confuse the issue between him being gay or a pedophile. I don't think that him being gay is the issue. I think him being a pedophile is the issue. But the rumors about him being gay have been going on for over 10 years. I mean, I, I'm nobody, and I'm in Manhattan Beach, Brooklyn, and heard about it. Right, because it was in The Advocate. So yes. what's proper, Joe, in Washington? Well, it's interesting that uh, the people who do confuse intentionally, I think, pedophilia and homosexuality on the religious right are now very angry 
or at least affecting to be very angry with the leadership of the House for allowing Mark Foley, known to be gay, at least on the Hill, to co-chair the Missing and Exploited Children Caucus. In other words, there's now a, uh, an uproar over You get a quick this. response, then we're going to a different clip. I think those people are angry because he, here's the, uh, the wolf in charge of the hen house. He, uh, here's a sexual predator in charge of exploiting right, and saying, missing children. They're saying children. because he was gay. No, he they're, they're really not. Well, I read the, the Family Research Council. If he were I mean. gay and, and none of this were an issue, I don't think we'd be hearing about it. Let's move on. Now, this next ad is a little out of date, but the Internet has made it topical again. This is an ad that was run by Tim Mahoney, the Democrat running against Mark Foley for his Florida seat. Let's see what the issues were before last week's revelations. Congressman Mark Foley wants to privatize Social Security and voted to increase Medicare premiums for seniors. That's bad. Foley's got to go. Foley's got to go. Foley took hundreds of thousands from the insurance industry while our rates skyrocketed. That's bad. Foley's got to go. That's bad. Foley's got to go. Mark Foley doesn't represent our values. Together we can end corruption in Congress and get America back on track. I'm Tim Mahoney and I approve this message. Joe Connison, did Tim Mahoney have a shot before this? About as much of a shot as the quality of that ad showed. That was not the greatest ad. Uh, it raised what ought to be a salient issue in South Florida, actually, which is Social Security and Medicare and the Republican... Topic of your uh, book, Raw Deal, right, New position Deal. ...position on those issues. And uh, in my view, surprisingly, few Democrats have brought that up because I think if the Republicans keep Congress, they will bring back Social Security privatization. But... That was not a particularly good ad. I think Tim Mahoney does have a good shot now, though, because there's nobody else to vote for except Mark Foley. How, how hard do you think it will be for Republicans, or how effectively do you think Governor Jeb Bush and others can get the word out, as they're starting to already, that, look, by Florida election law, election law, and here we are with Florida election law again, they can't replace him on the ballot with the Republican who would actually take the seat now. So people, after all this grotesque stuff we've seen, have to go in and pull the lever for Mark Foley in order to get another Republican to take that seat. I think you'd have to be a very dedicated Republican to do that. I think it's probably a lost cause. I, I read an interesting thing this week. It, it seems that voters uh, this election are not looking as carefully at details in people's uh, policy positions as they often do. And it, all these polls tracking um, the relation of, of positions to, uh, to popularity are, are finding that voters want to send a message about change, and that in these cases always means voting against Republicans. So Because they're the incumbents. Because by they're and large. the incumbents. He had a safe seat and I can't see somebody else getting that yeah, seat. No, Lisa's, see Lisa's right. It's hard to turn out, you know, right. that kind of number in that of case, Republicans who will pull that lever. Do you see any other specific seats that could be affected by this race, by these revelations? Well, I think the Reynolds race is going to be affected by it. Tom Reynolds in I upstate do. I New think, York. I think this Kirk But Fordham he says as soon as he heard uh, you know, any intimations of this, he did what you do in the workplace, tell your supervisor, oh, by the way, that's House but, Speaker but Dennis Hester. But that is the, those are the words of a lackey, not a leader. I mean, that's, that's just not, I don't think people are going to find that satisfactory up in, in the Buffalo area. I think they're going to say, mm, -mm. And, and the other problem that uh, Reynolds has is that uh, I think Jack, Jack Davis, the guy who's running against him, is a self-funding candidate, a, a very rich businessman who is ready to spend a lot of money and probably sees that it's worth spending that money. That helps you know. any candidate these right. days. But you don't think people will empathize to some degree with handling something discreetly in the workplace? If somebody had something vague and what he thought he had was these first emails or IMs right. that were, you know, not so bad about you, wouldn't you want them to go discreetly to your boss and say, look, I have this stuff about Joe, I don't know, let me tell rather than standing up in the lunchroom and saying, Joe Connison might be a pedophile. No, but there's, there's a third uh, alternative, Brian, which is to go back to Speaker Hester and say, what did we do about that? Instead, Tom Reynolds took a hundred grand and said nothing. And, and I think from the point of view of Jack Davis, it's pretty easy to make that look very bad. The top aide to Reynolds resigned today. How about his he in trouble now. Until this week, nobody seriously thought uh, that the Democrats had a real chance at, at gaining the House. 
and now people are worried. There are too many seats in play, and actually, I thought so. Some people thought so. Well, <laughs> a lot of my friends, on the Republicans tried so. not to think so. You know so, what? I, I think that this because this is not the war and not terrorism. It's not an issue where all of our our views are pretty defined. Um, this is something that everybody understands and that just disgusts everybody at a pretty visceral level. This has more potential to turn the election than pretty also, much any you issue know, we've you seen. You have the Republicans now saying among themselves, this leadership stinks. You know, the House is being run poorly. Uh, these people have to go. Uh, you know, Chris Shays said that. I mean, Republicans of various different ideologies. Chris Shays is in a very particular position in his swing district That's in Connecticut, right. which has to look half too. Democratic all the time. Right, but then there's the Washington Times, as you said. So across the Republican spectrum, people are saying, this House leadership is incompetent. All right. Let's look at another political ad. This one is for Michael Steele, who is running for U.S. Senate seat in Maryland. Mr. Steele wants to make sure you know how he feels about the issues. Let's watch. Hey, me again, Michael Steele. Soon your TV will be jammed with negative ads from the Washington crowd. Grainy pictures and spooky music saying Steele hates puppies. And worse, for the record, I love puppies. And I think you deserve better. Some real ideas for change, like a ban on all gifts from lobbyists to congressmen. And no last minute amendments for pork barrel spending. That's a start, because Washington can't fix our problems until we fix theirs. I'm Michael Steele, and this is my message. So we saw Michael Steele predict grainy attack ads, saying that he hates puppies. Let's see what the attack ad launched in response by the Democrats actually looks like. It's nice that Michael Steele likes puppies, but he's running for the United States Senate, and it's important to know where he stands on the issues. Michael Steele is a longtime supporter of George Bush. He supports the war in Iraq, supported Bush's veto of embryonic stem cell research, and he's against a woman's right to choose. Michael Steele, he likes puppies, but he loves George Bush. The Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee is responsible for the content of this advertising. Lisa Schifrin, interesting race. Democratic Senator Paul Sarbanes retiring in the state of Maryland. Control of the Senate is in play, like control of the House. Democrats would love to keep it. Republicans would love to take it. The Republicans have a very charismatic, as we see, African-American candidate in Mr. Steele. Talk about this race. Talk about those ads. The race has been a little bit of a mystery. Um, Mr. Steele is as you say, charismatic, he's attractive, he's well-spoken. I think people have been a little surprised that he hasn't just pushed through and, and done a whole lot better. Maryland is, um, like Pennsylvania, a state that uh, is blue and getting bluer. It's, uh, you know, that will be a hard seat. It's, I think people thought his charisma, that he would attract African Americans, but African Americans are very, very used to voting Democrat, and, you know, some some will vote for him because he's he's, one of their own, and some will stick with party and principle. The ads, I think those ads are a little silly. I mean, I think he set it up kind of poorly, and they responded. And it's kind of where you see all that campaign money go. Yeah, and Joe, it's the second Impressive ad. Impressive performance by him, though, I have to say. I thought he was, did a great job in that ad. And who do we never see in any of this? It's right. Ben the Cardin, right. the Democrat. Well, and, and, this, and the issues that uh, Steele brought up in his ad as the ones that he's endorsing were a little bit f f paper and phony. I mean, they're not what people are... What issues do you mean? His, the two reform issues that he mentions as, you know, lobbying and uh, whatever the other one was, banning some kind of amendment at the last minute. I mean, they're, they're not really salient in this, in this election. I think lobbying looked like it was going to be a more serious right. scandal issue because of the Jack Abramoff but stuff. But the Democratic the ad in response... Um, I think succeeded in making it look like Steele doesn't want you to know what his real politics it's are. It's the second ad that we've screened in this series that ends with somebody with George Bush framed in a heart. The first one was Joe Lieberman. <laughs> well, you know, I, clearly the president's unpopularity, particularly in blue states like Connecticut, uh, like Maryland, where I think, by the way, they're pretty disenchanted with their Republican governor by now, uh, is a way of defining a candidate. And it's a way of defining a, can a Republican candidate in a way that they don't want to be defined right now, and there's particularly a in places like that. There's a visual trick here uh, that somebody took me off to that, that I think I see reflected in that. For some reason, when the Democrats want to pair 
the Republican or Joe Lieberman with the president, they don't use a mean, ugly-looking picture of the candidate. They look a they, they use a beautiful, smiling, good-looking photo of the candidate paired with the president yeah, in like the heart. What is that? Of, it's like the pictures of you know Nancy Reagan looking up at Ron or Hillary trying to look lovingly at Bill. It, it's just it's meant to show that they're they're in bed together. Um, this is obviously you know unfair, uh, but there it is. The the issue that they're really trying to get out front is Iraq, and if you are. You know, at, pollsters will say this go around. If you're an Iraq voter, you're voting Democrat. If you're a security and terrorism voter, you'll stick with the president. As when, in, when the ad talks about Iraq, that's a way of saying, remember, remember, we right, hate this war. Right, and that's the national dynamic here. Democrats want to think, want you to think that this is a national election about the war in Iraq and President Bush. Republicans want you to think that this is about the individuals running in this campaign or that campaign or that district or this district. Although one by one, the individuals are running into problems themselves. Well, some, of them. Talking about. Some, some of them. Some of them are. Some of them. Uh, so. Speaking of Iraq, let's watch a video that has been making the rounds this week, originally from a 60 Minutes interview. It's with journalist Bob Woodward, who is speaking about State of Denial, his new book about President Bush and the war in Iraq. Let's watch. It is the oldest story in the coverage of government, uh, the failure to tell the truth. When you say the Bush administration has not told the truth about Iraq, what do you mean? I think probably the prominent, most prominent example uh, is the level of violence. The truth is that the assessment by the intelligence experts is that next year, now next year is 2007, yes. is going to get worse. And in public, you have the president and you have the Pentagon saying, oh no, things are going to get better. Now, there's public and then there's private. But mm -hmm. what do they do with the private? They stamp it secret. Lisa, the book, I don't have to tell you, is all the buzz in the news business. Does it matter to the outcome of the congressional elections? Only in the, in the larger sense I, I mentioned earlier, that, uh, that the more you convince voters that they want change, the more likely they are to vote for Democrats, regardless of the quality of the Democrat, you know, as we saw with the Steele Carden race. So that's true in Pennsylvania with Bob Casey, who's a weak candidate, and Rick Santorum was a, a known quantity. Casey is unknown. People are leaning toward him. He's the son of the governor with the same name. He's the son of that governor. He's got, you know, a lot of similar views. It's hard to distinguish the two on many issues. These candidates have not felt the need to uh, to offer. An, I mean, you, you would say you're opposed to the war in Iraq. What are you going to do? Nobody's talking about that. Democrats have come up with, with no concrete plans, no ideas about that. And yet, mm -hmm. because people are disenchanted, this is a fundamental problem uh, in a democracy, and I think it explains some of why the president and his cabinet kept those uh, those bad reports secret. Um, it's very hard to sustain support for a long war, for a long uh, involvement in another country that costs money and lives. Joe, honestly, well, especially when you told some lies in the beginning about what it was going to cost and how long it was going to take, but. Anyway, I'm sorry. Go though, ahead. though we've used this in our web video series, honestly, this is not being passed around the web that much. And I guess it's because Bob Woodward speaks in <laughs> slow and hard. Well, that's not the most interesting part draws. that you showed. But none of the clips from his TV interviews are winding up right. much viewed on YouTube and sites like that. Do you think it matters to the impact that he's having in 2006 that that's not the case? Well, I think the uh, book and the interview were commented a lot, uh, commented upon a lot in blogs uh, over the last several days. Uh, whether they're passing around clips, as you said, it takes too long to watch Woodward talking about his book. But uh, there were things that he said in the interview. For example, there was a great moment in that interview when, uh, when Woodward says, talks about the fact that Cheney told him that Kissinger is their main advisor on Iraq. And, and I thought that uh, Wallace was going to faint. Uh, he's, you know, he did a, a, a double take. And that I surprised think you? It did surprise me. Although... Is it a bad thing? You know, in recent years, when I've heard Henry Kissinger speak, he has changed a lot of his views on uh, detente, the Cold War, what should have been done in Vietnam. In general, I don't think 
Kissinger is the poster boy for <laughs> well, forward looking it, what policy. It, what it did was to uh, was to uh, reiterate or or reinforce the Vietnam Iraq it, analogy, yes. which is terrible for the Republicans. Next clip needs a little bit of context. This is a response from a joint press conference between President Bush and Pakistan's head of state, Pervez Musharraf. The reporter here has asked a question about something from Musharraf's new book, that the United States threatened to bomb Pakistan back to the Stone Age if they didn't cooperate after 9-11. Let's watch Musharraf's unexpected response. I would like to... Uh, um, uh, I am launching my book on the 25th, and I am on a bound to Simon & Schuster not to comment on the book before that day. So, uh, yeah. In other words, buy the book, is what he's saying. Joe, <laughs> <laughs> so, what a wacky media world we live in when the president or dictator or whatever he is of Pakistan can stand up there with the president and you know, pawn it off on Simon and Schuster like he's John Updike on a book tour or something. Really amazing. And of course, every politician's going to get the idea now. All I have to do is get a book contract. I won't have to answer any questions anymore. What was more important to him there, pleasing his publisher or avoiding the question? Oh, I think he's very practiced at avoiding questions. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot of free press in Pakistan. Lisa, you have um, a new issue advocacy group called Softer Voices, which mm. in the age of Hannity and Limbaugh, some might think is a counterintuitive name for a conservative advocacy group. Why Softer Voices? No, I think it's in the age of Hannity and Limbaugh, it's precisely the intuitive response. I think uh, we, we founded this group actually in, in 2004 to talk to women about security issues, about terrorism and, and the war and foreign policy, issues that women often tune out on, but which are everybody's issues now in a way they haven't always been. Um, my colleague Heather Higgins and I felt that uh, we saw a lot of data that suggested that women tune out when they see these kind of testosterone-fueled food fights. Mm -hmm. There are better ways to make your point, and there are people who want to listen to a rational discourse, as you yourself uh, you know, have always practiced here at this table. Thank you very much. And, Joe, you're going to get uh, agree about that. the last word. I'm glad we agree about that. Uh, can the Republicans close the gender gap in that way? Well, I think it's a smart strategy, I have to say. I think that's it's wise Thank for you. them to try to address women in that way. Whether the they have the, the better arguments or policies is a different matter, and I think it's an uphill battle to get women to agree with Republican policy. We finish on sort of a point of common ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that's it for tonight's show. We are here live Wednesday nights at 7.30 next week. We begin a series looking at some of television's best reporting about race and ethnicity. And don't forget to check out my daily radio show, weekday mornings at 10 on WNYC New York Public Radio. Tomorrow morning, instant messaging. It burned Mark Foley. Can it burn you too, even if you're legit? That's on 93.9 FM and 820 AM tomorrow morning at 10. Have a great night.